Tonight, a young couple in Blue Hill is living a lifestyle that looks foreign to most of us with ease and comfort. Forging their own path on their small sanctuary, the two are living what they teach and teaching others the skills to do the same. I am so happy and like I find so much meaning in my life and just like wake up every day like stoked to go to work on the fence or you know bring the goats out for a stroll down the road. We like to live outside. Colby Smith and Hannah Ray are living life on their own terms. It's more enjoyable to be outside than inside a house. So we've kind of taken that theme to make our lifestyle fit that. For the past three years, they've been living off of their 50 acre spread in Blue Hill, building everything on it, using primarily what the land has to offer. The primitive term can mean first skills, right? It's the yeah. prime skill. So. It's kind of the most simple skills that you need. But and also then, primitive skills can be super complex. They share those skills through their school, Way of the Earth. So they make like hide clothing that they can wear, and learn how to build shelters that are really effective and warm, and learn how to make fire from friction, which is always kind of magical, and stuff like that that really like makes them feel like deeply connected to this landscape. Both Colby and Hannah got interested in primitive skills or earth skills at a young age. At 13, Colby did an outward bound program. We had all these backpacks on, all this gear, and all these kids yelling and scaring everything. And even at that age, I was like, I wonder like how we could do it and be out here and not have all this gear and junk and just sort of, the pack was heavy, you know, I was getting tired. <laughs> so <laughs> how do I live without this stuff? And I know there's food and there's other animals, but I'm not really, I'm not seeing anything. He started hunting for answers. Hannah's curiosity grew when she was 16, watching the plants in her garden. I started noticing like all these weeds coming up in the garden and got super interested in what they were. And I went to the library and took out a book on weeds of the Northeast. I was <laughs> just like so surprised that like all these plants were like edible or medicinal or like useful in some way. And that I could like interact with these plants. Um, and they became like way more interesting than all the plants I was trying to grow. What most people discard, they're putting to good use. Box of dandelion roots. And primrose. And primrose. They store food in their root cellar, cooled in the summer by the spring that they've engineered to run through it. Oh, this is uh, rendered pork no, fat. fat. Um, or maybe it's bear fat. Uh, that's what we use instead of butter. They salt mackerel and roadkill. They eat that too. That stuff is a mix of, of roadkill deer and roadkill moose. And we like to eat a lot of wild food too. They forage wild rice and make their own acorn flour, an intensive process, but one they say is well worth it. But not everything they eat comes from the land. We definitely buy things from the grocery store. We do buy bacon sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, chocolate, it's hard to get. So. In the warm months, they bathe in the nearby pond or creek. We fill it up with water. But in winter, a cast iron tub. Fire underneath it. Serves as an outdoor hot tub. It's really nice on a cold winter evening. And while they love to be outside cooking in their outdoor uh, kitchen in summer, the cold pushes them indoors into the earth lodge they built. About 400 cut and peeled spruce, mostly spruce poles. Heated by a rocket stove. And the wood kind of goes in vertically and burns from the end, the tips sideways into a, a kind of a heavily insulated chimney inside of this can. Sleeping on a bed of cattail mat and sheepskin and wearing clothes they've made themselves. This is my raccoon purse. It is a very, very amount of looks at the grocery store. One thing people might be surprised at is that we find this lifestyle really like comfortable. <laughs> it might seem like it would be very uncomfortable because we're outside every day all the time. We have to haul water in and, and get chop our own wood and bring it in. And you know, all these projects that we're doing require a lot of work on our bodies. And people like, I think, associate living more of an earth-based life as a really like they're kind of sacrificing their comfort and modern conveniences. But I think as you push yourself to live more earth connected, your idea of what comfort is really shifts and changes. They use power from a solar panel to charge their phones and give them light. And we're not really against the technology, but sometimes the simpler way is often the better way still. They have cars, an Instagram account and a tractor. In today's world, we've kind of 
displaced community with technology. Everything is a tool, you know? The question I ask myself is, if this is going to help me, f like, help further our connection to nature, like, what does that look like and how can we use it? And then what also is it sacrificing? It may be an extreme way to live. That's the main reason why we live like this, because it's, I find it more fun than living in a big house. And the simplicity adds to the, the ease of living. But for Colby and Hannah, it keeps them grounded. These skills are free. They're our birthright. And um, the more we can share them people, I, I feel like the more self-reliant they can become on their own. Now this year, the couple is offering several workshops, including a five-month immersion program where people will come live on their land, starting out in tents, and eventually make their own earth dwelling. As always, you can find out more information about their school and this story on the 207 section of our website and mobile app. I thought that was pretty fascinating. Me too. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs>